History Research Center at the University of Minnesota. The IHRC aims to transform the way we understand immigration in the past and the present. Welcome to today's webinar on climate impacts as drivers of displacement. This is the first webinar in a series of events on climate change, human rights, and forced migration that the IHRC is co-sponsoring along with the Human Rights Program. We're both in the College of Liberal Arts, and then we're also co-sponsoring with the Binger Center for New Americans and the Human Rights Center at the law school. Uh, this series is going to focus on countries' responses to human rights challenges created by climate change. We'll be looking at how the global community, the U.S. government, the private sector, and others monitor the impact of climate change, and we'll discuss the important questions posed by climate change and evaluate our responses to it. I want to begin by acknowledging that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus is located on Dakota land, and to Today, many indigenous people, including Dakota and Ojibwe throughout the state, call the Twin Cities home. Now I'm going to turn the program over to Sarah Brennis, who is the executive director of the Binger Center for New Americans. Sarah is an expert in immigration law, and she plays a leadership role on campus and in the community, bringing together stakeholders to discuss important human rights and migration related issues such as climate change. And she is going to introduce today's speakers. Great, thanks Michelle. Before we get started, I just want to highlight a few housekeeping items. The webinar will be recorded. Um, I will introduce both speakers and they'll provide some brief comments on the topic. Uh, that should leave us about 30 minutes for moderator and audience questions. The question and answer portion will happen in the Q&A function on the Zoom and you can submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll turn the audience questions at the end of the program and you can choose to submit your questions anonymously if you don't want your name to be mentioned when the question is posted. We have two phenomenal speakers with us here today. I'm gonna to introduce both of them and then Samudu will offer her comments and then um, Yael will give her comments and then we'll turn to the questions. So first, um, Yael Shacker is Director for the Americas and Europe at Refugees International. It's a non-governmental policy and advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. Yale's report on Refugees International have been on such topics as visas for victims of trafficking, the Remain in Mexico policy, and the COVID-19 ban on access to asylum at the border. Haitian migration throughout the Western Hemisphere and the evolution and variety of parole programs for those seeking refuge in the United States. In addition to her policy and legal briefs on the subject, Yal is completing a book on the history of asylum in the United States since the late 19th century. Her recent academic writing on US immigration and refugee law have appeared in the Journal of American History and in Who's America? Immigration Policy since 1980. Yael received her PhD in American Studies from Harvard University in 2016 and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Historical Studies at the University of Texas. Our, um, we're going to start with Samudu Atapatu um, and her, uh, her comments. She's a teaching professor and director of the Global Legal Studies Center at the University of Wisconsin Law School. She's also executive director of the campus-wide interdisciplinary human rights program. She serves as the lead counsel for human rights at the Center for International Sustainable Development Law based in Montreal, Canada, and is on the advisory board for the McGill International Journal of Sustainable Development Law and Policy and is affiliated faculty at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Sweden. She's published widely on the fields of international environmental law, climate change, environmental rights, and sustainable development. She holds an LLM and a PhD from the University of Cambridge and is an attorney at law of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. I will hand it over to Samudu to give her comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. Um, so let me share my screen. Can you guys see it? Yeah, all right. So um, 
Well, I thought I'll start with this slide um, because this um, child is asking the rest of the world um, to prepare a place for his whole country to move to. And this is the uh, situation we are facing, we'll face in the future because of uh, consequences associated with climate change. So we will see um, individuals and families moving or being forced to move as a result of climate change. We are also looking at a situation where entire countries might have to be relocated. Um, so this is, much more than just refugee law that we should be looking at. We should be looking at uh, international laws relating to statehood, nationality, and things like that as well. Um, and um, today we are going to look at climate refugees per se, and I will look at the global picture. Um, I know this slide is not very um, clear, but it shows the hotspots for uh, climate refugees. And we know that Africa, South Asia, and Latin America are going to be uh, the hotspots for um, climate refugees. And these numbers are in the millions, unfortunately. Um, so I would like us to take a step back and put this um, phenomenon of climate migration within a larger issue of global iniquity. Um, we have um, a global system where just 26 people, just 26 billionaires, control more wealth than 3.6 billion of the world's poorest people combined. The, these uh, numbers are from Oxfam. Um, just 26 individuals versus 3.6 billion people. And we need to realize that this astounding inequity is not a coincidence. Uh, this is the result of centuries of colonial domination, subordination, and also, um, and of course, um, racial policies and laws and institutions that enable this to take place, right? And climate change is also a result of this inequity and these practices, historic practices, as well as, of course, um, industrialization and all that. Um, and if you look at the hotspots for climate migration, these are mostly former colonies. That is not to say that, you know, the major, major emitters like the US will not be affected. Um, there are communities that are being, um, forced to relocate even in the US, and I will talk a little bit about them, but these uh, hotspots are mostly former colonies. So think about that relationship. And this shows the percentage of CO2 emissions by world population and 10%, richest 10% are responsible for 50% of consumption rela related emissions. 10% responsible for 50%, and the poorest 50% are responsible only for 10% of global emissions, right? But if you look at the vulnerability to climate change, the situation is flipped, right? It's Africa, Latin America, South Asia, where their contribution to climate change is quite small compared to the major emitters. So, the contribute, there's a disproportionate impact on those who contribute at least to the problem. And you can see the small island states um, highlighted here as well, right? Uh, but this is closer to home in Alaska, where um, this uh, village is forced to move as a result of climate change. And they're awaiting relocation. They're not sure who is going to pay for this, um, so, you know, 2025 is not very far away. Um, and we knew this problem for several years, but they're still awaiting relocation. And this is an indigenous group uh, for whom their land is very, very important, has cultural significance. And this is Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana, which uh, 
is actually being relocated to the mainland because of climate change. Um, again, it's an indigenous community. Many um, people did not want to move, but they have no option. Um, so this is right here in the US. So um, one of the issues, of course, is we know that climate change is um, a driver of migration and displacement, but it's not the only reason why people move. So it's hard to find exact numbers of climate refugees. Um, and the forecast is um, something like between 20 to 200 million by 2050. Um, and it can be either cross-border or internal, and we know that most migration will take place internally. Uh, most displacement will be internally. Um, there was a, a World Bank report uh, that um, said that climate change could force 216 million people to migrate within their own countries by 2050. So that does not really implicate international law because people are moving uh, within their own country. But imagine even within your own country, um, it's a big decision to move or being displaced. Um, and as we speak, there are communities that are being forced to uh, relocate. And we saw after um, disasters like Hurricane Katrina, how people um, had to relocate. Um, again, from the same report, uh, it acknowledged that climate change is a powerful driver of internal migration. And these are the numbers uh, according to the various regions uh, that the report highlights. So Sub-Saharan Africa with the highest number of 86 million going down to 5 million in Eastern Europe. Um, so South Asia has 40 million. So whatever the number we come up with, it'll be in the million. So that's something I want um, the participants to think about. How are we going to deal with this level of people, this number of people moving, whether it's internally or across borders? Of course, if it is across borders, um, things will be um, very different because it uh, implicates uh, international law. So uh, there are different reasons why uh, people move. Uh, there could be slow onset events like sea level rise, desertification, um, and lack of resources. We know that because of climate change, resources will um, get diminished, um, like water, food. Um, so when we have more and more people um, trying to get fewer and fewer resources, there could be conflict. Um, and climate change could exacerbate uh, poverty. Um, and then we also have severe weather events that we have been experiencing throughout. Of course, climate change is not the only reason why these are happening, but climate change is contributing to the severity, um, the increased numbers, um, of um, these incidents. And then of course, um, some movement may be, uh, or some relocation may be temporary uh, as a result of severe weather events maybe. Um, and some movement may be voluntary. Um, it could be, I mean, in most instances, um, it's involuntary. It's circular sometimes and mostly internal and sometimes cross-border. And with small island states that I mentioned, uh, planned relocation might be the only option. People are already moving from some of these uh, countries. Um, so the other point that I want to highlight is that at the same time we are talking about climate migration, we also need to look at populations who cannot move even if they want to. Um, it could be due to poverty, social norms, um, disability, age. Um, so these are called trap populations and we need to pay attention to them as well. And there's not much information about these groups. Um, so we need to have more uh, research, look at these reasons why people cannot move, et cetera. Um, so another thing that I, I want to highlight is that although we refer to these people 
as climate refugees or environmental refugees is not a legal term. Under international law, this is not a legally accepted um, category yet, at least. Uh, and there are many um, terms that have been used, forced climate migrants, climate displaces, climate refugees is the most commonly used. And these terms simply describe those who are compelled to move as a result of climate related consequences. Um, and there's an increasing recognition that climate change and environmental factors will contribute to migration. But as I said, this is not a legally accepted um, term under international law. So there's a pro protection gap that exists with regard to climate refugees if they cross an international border. So if you look at the existing framework governing refugees, it's a Geneva Convention relating to um, refugees that was adopted after the Second World War. Uh, in 1951, there's a very specific definition of a refugee. So um, that's a person who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted, and the reasons for persecution are also given in the law. So it has to relate to race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. Um, so as you can see, it's a very specific definition of a refugee and climate change cannot fall within this unless um, climate change triggers, let's say, a conflict. And that has happened too. Um, and it's likely to increase um, when these consequences um, get more and more severe. So uh, it's not all doom and gloom in this area. There was... Um, a case a couple of years ago uh, that was um, decided by um, the UN uh, Human Rights Committee. A citizen of Kiribati applied for a refugee status in New Zealand, which was um, rejected. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, and then when his application, he, he was actually deported to uh, Kiribati. And then he filed this um, application with the Human Rights Committee under Article 6 of the um, uh, ICC, International, in, International Covenant on um, Civil and Political Rights. Um, the application itself failed, but the Human Rights Committee recognized that climate change could pose a serious risk to life that it triggers the application of the non refoulement principle, which means that you cannot send somebody back to their home countries if there's a serious risk to life. And the committee recognized that climate change could, in certain instances, pose that serious risk. Um, so this opened the door a little bit to uh, climate refugees, but of course the bar that was set was pretty high, but it was a good uh, recognition. Um, so to conclude, um, climate change poses serious risk. Climate change and climate migration and displacement um, pose a serious risk to human rights, starting from right to life, to food, water, health, privacy, freedom of movement, all that. Um, it also raises justice issues because, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a disproportionate impact on those who contribute at least to the problem, like poor and vulnerable communities, small island states, um, who are at the risk of disappearing, uh, women, um, migrants, etc. And these are both in the global north as well as in the global south. The UN Special Report on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights referred to climate change as climate apartheid, because there's a big divide between the affluent who have the resources to adapt to the uh, consequences and those who will be left to suffer. So it's important to adopt a rights and justice framework to address the plight of climate refugees. And we also need to think about the responsibility of major emitters to help them, especially countries like the United States. The US is responsible for approximately 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. And the White House report um, that on climate refugees 
actually said it does not agree with the Tetiora decision <laughs> that I just mentioned. Um, so let's see how um, things will pan out with regard to climate refugees in the US, uh, because we are already seeing climate refugees in the US. So I will stop there and hand over to you. Al. Thank you. Great, thanks so much uh, for, for really giving us a good global context of the of the situation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Yael to, to focus a little more on, on home in the US response um, to climate change and forced migration. Hi, okay, yeah, can you hear me? Um, can folks hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks. Trying was trying to ch share my screen. Um, thanks again. It's an honor to be here. Um, um, so I'm a historian, as was mentioned, and I just wanted to say, you know, um, that was a perfect lead in to what I'm going to talk about. I, I should say at the front that, you know, the United States, um, you know, was very influential in, in helping draft the 1951 Refugee Convention that created um, the definition that was mentioned of a refugee, but did not sign uh, the Refugee Convention until many years later and did not integrate um, the refugee definition into U.S. law until 1980, which I'll talk about. And I should say, you know, the U.S. goes its own way. And even when you're talking about people who are crossing international borders, uh, many countries create their own immigration policies and refugee policies that really are um, in sync in some ways, but also idiosyncratic and not in sync with, um, you know, the international refugee framework. Um, the U.S., um, again, did not sign on to the Refugee Convention um, in 1951, 52, but it did have laws in the 1950s and 1960s that um, talked about refugees as people mostly fleeing um you know, natural calamities. Um, and what it did was actually um, allow some of these folks, some either coming from natural calamities, uh, usually earthquakes, volcanoes, as you see here, um, catastrophic calamities. These were like big weather, big events, not related to climate. Most of them are actually earthquakes. Those are not climate related, um, but they were environmental or natural. Um, uh, and there were statuses in which people could come, usually reserving visas. Um, Congress would reserve special visas for folks coming um, in this way. Um, oops. Um, in 1980, the U.S. did integrate um, uh, the U.N. definition of a refugee uh, into U.S. law, uh, created what we call the refugee resettlement system, whereby people can be picked overseas um, to be resettled in the United States through the refugee resettlement program. Um, that's Section 207 of the law you see here. And then the 1980 Refugee Act also called for the creation of our contemporary asylum system in the United States, which allows people to come to the United States on their own, to the border or otherwise, in whatever status, and ask to be assessed whether or not they meet the refugee definition. Um, also, a little later, um, and now by this time, um, by, nine, by 1980, and the TPS statute, the Temporary Protection Statute, which I'm going to talk about in a second, that was 1990. So in 19, by 1980s already, we're already, there's no, a much more awareness of what climate warming is, you know, um, and the idea of that, that we're talking about the kind of things that would affect displacement based on climate change, you know, the warming temperature of the earth leading to extremes of heat and cold, drought, storms, sea level rise, desertification. Um, and, but one of the things that you see about this, so that there was already awareness of those kinds of things in, 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 in the culture, but in the science, um, but this if you'll notice this TPS statute, first of all, it doesn't provide a pathway to the United States for those displaced um, by, um, as you'll see, um, um, 
in the, let's see, the provision. Um, oops. Uh, B1, um, BI, where there's been an earthquake, flood, drought, epidemic, or other, other environmental disaster. Um, but it, it's supposed to be temporary. And what this is really is it's assuming the kind of temporariness to, to you know, even if it's a climate related um, event, so like a flood, for example. Um, it's assuming it's temporary. It's assuming it's something that's not a long, slow onset kind of climate related change. Um, and the statute is basically allowing people who have already made it to the United States not to be sent back to their home country if that home country is then deemed to be worthy of TPS for one of those reasons. Um, and there are also even exceptions if you if you if you, you have a criminal you have you have two felony convictions. Not everybody is protected by this statute, and certainly temporary protected status does not protect people. Um, in another country when a climate disaster strikes to give them a pathway to the United States. They have to already be in the United States um, and then their removal is basically put off um, for a while. Now, it was already mentioned the, the Biden report on the impact of climate change and migration that came out in October of 2021. Um, and what it really chronicled, I should say, is mostly what it talks about the, the vast majority of the report is really about um, the use of aid, U.S. aid and humanitarian assistance to help countries prepare, respond, adapt, recover. Um, it's focused mostly on disaster risk reduction and assistance to host countries, even if somebody has left their home country because of a, a climate related event, they were displaced and they moved to a host country, the aid can go there to stabilize populations there, so that people don't actually need to, to migrate to the United States, there is sort of a deterrent emphasis in the report that you know we do not want people to come to the United States if we can help them closer to the home or if we can help prevent them having to be displaced in the first place by doing mediation or relocation in their home countries we should definitely work on U.S. should expend its resources on that um, mostly be, partly because many people displaced by climate would rather not migrate across a border. People want to re re rebuild and go home for the most part, um, but also because the U.S. is worried about many, many people crossing into the United States. Um, but there is a section of the report that talks about when there is, when there can be um, an interplay between climate change and eligibility for refugee status. Um, it cites a UNHCR legal considerations paper that has recognized, for example, where the effects of climate change, oops, I keep doing that, sorry. Um, where the effects of climate change um, may require that, um, um, may actually implicate um, uh, violence, conflict, or persecution leading to displacement, people might qualify for refugees. So there are some prominent examples here when the government withholds or denies relief um, from the impacts of climate change to specific individuals who share protected characteristics in a manner or to a degree amounting to persecution. So that's basically saying that the persecution has to do with a, a refusal to deliver aid um, or when the uh, adverse impacts of climate change may affect whether an individual can like move with internally to a country or needs to leave. Um, or, you know, where basically um, climate acti activists or environmental defenders are persecuted for speaking out against other government inaction on climate change um, may also have a, that's basically a, a, a basically a political opinion um, based um, claim for refugee status. And one of the things the, the report suggests is trying to figure out how, you know, what, when, what, what kinds of claims people might have would actually, that will be, relate climate to refugee status. So basically when you have a claim based on environmental dissent or climate change activism, which would basically be a political claim, political refugee claim, um, when you don't have a viable 
again, internal relocation, when people experience um, are basically persecution because their, their governments don't provide them with aid. So it's basically, which rises to the level of persecution or when climate change um, basically, affects whether or not a state can protect people. I mean, so we can think of examples about how this might work. Um, but, you know, we, we can think of examples where government um, response to a disaster is extremely biased, where government inaction related to climate change or environmental disasters may be actually characterized more as like, almost like government action because their failure to prepare for a disaster or the provision of, or discriminatory provision of relief afterwards really affirms a, is basically constitutes a kind of persecution, um, and I and we can talk later about, about some examples of this. But uh, uh, one of the the kinds of activism that my organization focused on, um, I've been writing, working with a group of people on basically an asylum manual to train asylum officers that when they hear claims like the ones that were just mentioned that 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 rise to um, rise to the level of a persecution claim on that meets the refugee definition, they shouldn't discount it just because somebody said, you know, they initially left their home country or their house was destroyed by a hurricane that shouldn't be discredited as a uh, as a valid refugee claim, especially because there are are times when, for example, the government then didn't prov provide aid um, to that person um, or to a group of people in a particular area so that it would actually raise to a persecution claim. Um, Another possibility that my organization has pushed for is in terms of refugee resettlement, the way that the United States does refugee resettlement is that it frequently um, prioritizes certain groups for resettlement. And one of the things that we've suggested is prioritizing groups where um, where who have fled their home country and moved to a third country, for example, and are waiting there. Um, and in that country where they're waiting, they're affected by extreme climate change um, and climate issues. And so where you're where you're seeing people who would who are um, would be considered refugees for because they meet the refugee standard, but are also affected by climate change, these these groups of people should be prioritized for resettlement in through the US refugee resettlement program in the United States. And you see some examples here. Um, one thing, uh, as was already mentioned, um, the United States does not actually agree with the Yoda case. Um, it doesn't really see it itself as under uh, uh, as uh, as as having to as obliged under international human rights law to extend protection to individuals fleeing the impacts of climate change. But it does actually suggest the creation of legal pathways for individuals. Um, um, who need protection, um, exploring, for example, how Congress might actually create new pathways or evaluating whether changes made to the TPS statute might help protect more pe people um, from being returned to countries affected by climate change. Um, and I should say, you know, as a historian, just if I could step back for a second, you know, I'm uh, I'm biased towards thinking along the lines as was suggested earlier about thinking about these pathways in particular ways. You know, the U.S. has had long-term relationships with particular countries. I'm thinking of particular countries in the Western Hemisphere, past in, sort of imperial imperial relations with them have affected their economies greatly, have affected and invested in development in those countries greatly. Um, sometimes those development schemes do push um, migration um, and other have, have obviously affected the politics of those uh, countries. And there is a way in which a pathway uh, for climate displace for the climate displaced from those countries is sort of a, is like a kind of a reparation. Like it would it could be seen as a kind of reparative path for people for the damage that U.S. was partly responsible for causing um, in those countries. Um, our, I should also say that the U.S. refugee system is biased in some ways towards understanding of past persecution. When you've been persecuted in the past, when you've experienced harm in the past, it's assumed that you will have a 
you will meet the refugee definition in terms of you shouldn't be removed because of a well-founded fear of future persecution, which is the way um, the refugee stat statute is written. And so there actually is a bias already into saying like, let's look at the past, let's look at what people experienced in the past and assume that they should be given refugee status. So as a historian, that's, that's interesting. I would say that scientists who really focus on refugee um, crises and displacement, they really focus on prediction, predicting and anticipating and planning ahead for like future displacement crises. And some models out there in the world for pathways are really innovative in this way. So like, for example, you know, Argentina has this new humanitarian visa uh, for the climate displaced, which is actually given not only to people who have already been displaced, um, you know, but given to people who live in areas where they anticipate that there will be displacement, they can already qualify for a humanitarian visa. So it has this sort of forward-looking planning. So you're not just giving a visa to somebody who's, you know, already in dire straits and been displaced, but you're anticipating, you're sort of planning the movement. I would say that answering the call of the Biden administration for Congress to create some new pathways uh, for the climate displaced, there have been two pieces of legislation that have been introduced in recent years that sort of do this. One was introduced by um, Senator Markey and Congresswoman Velasquez in New York. Um, Senator Markey is from Massachusetts, um, that really actually create basically 50,000 visas for the climate displaced. Um, you can apply for these, whether or not uh, as a person overseas or a person in the United States. But the idea is, is that this is separate and apart from the refugee definition. It's creating a new definition and providing 50,000 slots for those folks. There's still a lot to be worked out as to who would be eligible for these. 50,000 slots is not enough for all the people who would want these. Um, but it is something because it's moving away from just a strict focus on a refugee definition and creating a new climate displaced person idea um, uh, and creating slots, a, a pathway for those people to the United States visa slots. Um, it also al allows for the adjustment to permanent status of the people who receive these. So it's a, a visa towards a permanent status in the United States for climate displaced people. Another, the last thing I'll say is another option, which is seeming more, less and less likely these days, given the limits on asylum and on who's eligible for asylum in the United States. Just yesterday, a new restriction on that eligibility came out for especially for people coming to the border from the Western hemisphere. But, but there's another, another idea that was put forward in the Refugee Protection Act that was just introduced um, in December by the outgoing Senator Leahy of Vermont and on Congresswoman Lofgren of California is to basically create a complementary protection standard um, that would allow people to get kind of permanent status in the United States, a kind of asylum, not only if they meet the refugee definition, but you'll see number two here, if they're actually um, fleeing exceptional situations such as environmental other crises or disasters, including from the effects of climate change. So it's basically saying those people, it's again, a different standard, a new standard um, that recognizes that it's sort of a hard fit to fit climate displaced people into the refugee standard as it now stands. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So I think that was really helpful to get us in a, a, a global context and really digging into how the US is, is not and could be responding um, from an immigration policy standpoint. Um, I'm gonna kick off some questions, uh, zoom us back out a little bit to, to basics and sort of terminology. Um, Samudu, the, the, the term you, you've been using and have, have cited has had a lot of use is climate refugee, but that also, that term's also received some criticism. Can you explain a little bit um, why, why that term um, can be seen as problematic? Um, so, as I said, um, there's a very specific definition of refugees on the international law. So the refugee um, experts uh, feel that, you know, um, that definition might get diluted if we add climate refugees to this. Um, at the same time, those who are going to be displaced, uh, especially those from small island states, 
uh, don't want to be called refugees because as you know, um, at least, well, I should say in many countries, especially here, there's a negative connotation attached to refugees. Um, and um, these small island states, people from small island states argue that we did not create this problem, you guys did, right? So we should not be called refugees. So, um, so because of that, there are, you know, um, criticisms against uh, this and also confusing the legal definition of a refugee by, you know, referring to these as climate refugees because as I said, it's not a legal category recognized on the international law. Mm -hmm. And maybe somewhat as, as a little bit of follow on uh, to that, um, in some of your recent articles, you, you called out this, this common myth that many forced migrants flock to the global north when in reality, the countries that host the greatest number of forced migrants due to climate change are in the global south or, or, or really um, forced migrants and refugees in general. Um, and interestingly, in one of your articles, you pointed out that um, the top three hosts for refugees in 2015 were Turkey, Pakistan, and Lebanon. And we know that in 2022, floods in Pakistan killed nearly 2,000 people. Um, the count in, in the earthquake in Turkey and Syria is over 40,000 now. Um, how do you think the international community should take into account not only the, the really predictable forced migration from climate change, but also this double impact of climate change and its impact on the, on the most common uh, host countries? So I think it's important to realize that um, people move to the nearest place. They don't think, you know, when there's a disaster or, uh, you know, a conflict or something, or oh, I'm going to the United States, or I'm going to Europe. That's a longer term decision at some point when they are faced with immediate danger, they move to the closest possible place. Um, and that's often uh, in the global south. Um, so as uh, the numbers show, um, these countries that are um, you know, struggling with their own populations are hosting large numbers of refugees as well. Um, there was a um, documentary done on climate refugees uh, a while ago, and there is an implication that, oh, we will be faced with an influx of climate refugees if we sort of open our doors. And I mean, we know that that's not going to be the case. And uh, sorry, if I may add, and that's that's why I talked about the responsibility of the global north, because particularly for something like climate change, they created this problem. Of course, the other countries are contributing to it, but the major emitters are responsible for the majority of emissions, plus the companies. So um, can we look at a way that these are held accountable, not legally, but at least financially to help these refugees because they are being forced to move, lose everything they have, but their contribution to the problem is very, very little. So I think we need to think about that aspect as well. Thanks. Yael, in, in, in looking at the... Um, report, the UN report on uh, climate change and human rights, they sort of identified four displacement scenarios, the weather-related disasters, sort of sudden events, gradual environmental deterioration, slow onset disasters, increased disaster risk and relocation of people from high-risk zones, and then the social upheaval and violence attributable to climate change-related factors. Do you see in the way the U.S. is prioritizing either um, proposals in action, uh, wishful thinking. Is the U.S. prioritizing any of those categories over others? And and do you have any comment on that? Yeah, there's least dis like good discussion about the slow onset um, disasters. Um, so like, you know, a lot of aid goes to immediate hurricane relief. Like I was just in Guatemala, you know, there's a, you know, U.S. sent a lot of aid to there in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane, you know, two years later, 
things are still bad, but the aid has like is long gone and people are still stuck. It's a lot of trapped people basically stuck in places where not a lot is, a lot is done because what ends up happening is there's a hurricane and then it weakens infrastructure and then there's another storm and then there's another storm. Um, and so I think it's the longer term. And as I said, I think the TPS statute, the fundamental issue is, is that if it's, you have to actually prove that it's your, it's only a short term thing that's going to be mediated. So um, if there's actually an event that seems like it's never going to be fixed, TPS can actually be taken away. That has happened, right? So if it's a place where the disaster will not be fixed because it's a slow onset thing that is going to require either complete relocation or tremendous mediation that's not being done either by the government or um, through the use of foreign aid, um, those folks are really, really, I think, stuck. And we haven't really come up with policy solutions. And I think some of those things that I talked about at the end, you know, for climate displaced people are trying to get at that, create a path for people who may really have to leave permanently where they live and and, and move someplace else. Uh, because in the, for, it, for the long term, nothing much is going to happen. Great. On that note, we've got a couple uh, questions from the audience. So I think either of you could answer this a question from Hannah. Uh, what collaborations or opportunities for collaboration do you see between environmental scientists and human rights attorneys to respond to climate driven forced migration? So I, I think it would be helpful for, you know, for like, um, understanding where, um, who should get visas, um, uh, that it would be helpful to have good data and good science on the people who most need it. Um, and to understand which disasters and which folks um, can't, mediation will not help, aid will not help, we need a pathway. Like, we, you know, I, I, I think that's where the science can really come in. Let me let some new speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, we have enough information to know that this is happening and this is, it's going to get worse. Um, and whatever numbers we are looking at, it's going to be in the millions. Um, so, as I said, most of the migration or displacement will be internal, and uh, which means that we saw where the hotspots are. Um, and these are developing countries. Some, some of them are least developed countries. So we really need to help them to adapt, to look after these um, uh, people who are going to be displaced. Otherwise we are um, adding uh, injury to insult uh, because you know we are just going to let them cope with these numbers and we know that it's not possible. Um, so training, providing financial assistance, providing resources, um, and you know we might have to um, uh, relocate them uh, proactively because some places we know are going to be. Um, are not going to be safe for people to be living in. So that's where the science comes in, you know, identifying these hotspots, the uh, danger areas um, to relocate people proactively. And then, of course, we have this larger issue of small island states. What are we going to do? The humanitarian issue. I think the legal issues we can deal with at some point, right? Um, Statehood is and fiction that we came up with. So I'm sure we can come up with another legal fiction to accommodate deterritorialized states. But uh, what I'm more worried about are the people. What are we going to do about the people? Where are we going to relocate? Because we re really need to think about that situation before we are actually faced with that um, issue. Mm -hmm. If I, if I could just say one other thing, which is that, I mean, just drawing on the experience I just had in Guatemala, where some people who are peri-urban or urban were thinking about the possibility of migration, but the people that were mostly living in rural communities that were more trapped, right. um, 
Um, I think that, you know, scientists can be helpful there too. I, I just, I felt that what one of the big problems was the way that the type of aid that was being distributed wasn't quite what would really help in the long run. Like what they basic, what was really needed was biofortified climate resilient crops for people to plant. Um, not, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, that and getting that to happen in places that are dry and places that are placed by climate displacement. So dealing with like food insecurity issues where people are that are the result of climate change. Maybe it's not a migration issue, but for those trapped populations, I still think there's so much work that can be done. Thanks. And I think you both kind of touched on this with the, um, the previous question, but we've got a question from Sam. Um, do you believe the international community is late in or not acting fast enough to address this climate migration crisis? And do we have time to prevent a major international event? Um, I can go first. <laughs> Um, as you know, international law um, moves really, really slowly. International diplomacy takes years. Um, in fact, the very first um, IPC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said in their very first report that one of the major impacts of climate change will be on human migration. And that was in 1990. It took the international community 25 years to even establish a task force on climate um, displacement associated with climate change. And that was at the Paris conference in 2015. Um, so yes, we are moving pretty slowly, uh, but at the same time, uh, we still have time to um, prevent a major catastrophe, major sort of overhaul of the um, the system where, you know, people will start moving. Uh, I think we, we need to be very proactive. It's not too late, uh, but uh, time is running out. Uh, yeah, 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 and I think you know internal displacement is such a. There's always like so international law has is is weak on that area. Period. Not just for the climate internally displaced, just on internal displacement because it's it's actually within countries, within sovereign countries that have their own laws. And so I think the fact is that most climate displaced people are, as was mentioned, like in their own countries, and so. Countries have to pass IDP laws. Countries have to pass laws that will protect, that will provide for their own citizens who are displaced. Um, so I think not only as international law to deal with people who do cross borders, um, haven't really come up with a standard that people will accept internationally. So it's sort of state by state, this idea, this idea, nothing sort of big picture. Um, but I also think governments themselves, you know, internally have so much work that they they still need to do um, uh, on their own. Um, and on the note of slow moving international law, slow moving government response, uh, do you know of any networks that are working on the issue within the Americas uh, with a migration focus, non NGOs and and others that are that are trying to do do this work proactively and bubble it up to the government decision makers? Yeah, I know the International Refugee Assistance Project, which I don't know if it might have a chapter at, at University of Minnesota or University of Wisconsin, but um, th they're, they're convening um, sort of transnational uh, work in the Americas on this. Um, there's also some like innovative work happening in other parts of the world, especially in Africa, where I know that there's interesting, essentially regional agreements where people can move between countries temporarily, like in a, in a, in a region, they basically can enter a country temporarily, stay there for a little while, and then move back. There's like a free movement within, within a group of countries in one region. Uh, that is a, another way of thinking about this. Like if it's, you think about it temporarily, right? You move to another country briefly, you have permission to stay there for a little while until you go back. Um, rather than having to be something permanent. So I think there are some models out there. Um, and I think there are, I think regionally is, you know, because Africa has, and, and both Africa and Latin America have um, regional refugee 
agreements that have broader standards than uh, the UN refugee definition, the Cartagena standard in the Americas is basically like a public disorder standard. Like if you fled public disorder, you can kind of get refugee status. Uh, Africa has something similar. And so it it, it is, there, there's already on the books a standard that might be more helpful in certain parts of the world to encompass people displaced by climate change. So that, that's, that is promising. Um, and if I can add to that, there's a group in Alaska that's working with some of these um, um, communities that are that, uh, that are awaiting relocation. I think Alaska Institute for Justice. Uh, I think that's the correct um, term. And they actually submitted a complaint to uh, UN special mandate holders against the US um, about the climate refugee issue. So there are other human rights avenues that people are exploring mm -hmm. um, because these human rights uh, treaty bodies are becoming increasingly um, involved in climate change issues. Um, looking at you know providing comments, uh, coming up with general comments, concluding observations. Um, so that's another avenue that uh, we can look at uh, because as you know, uh, human rights implicate a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, climate change implicates a lot of human rights. So. And if I can just say one thing that, you know, one of the problems with the U.S. report is that, and just with a, a, a focus on development aid as the answer to climate displacement is that obviously development has a complicated relationship with climate displacement and many people you know see development as also creating you know uh displacement displacing communities and i think that the like in the climate report it's very interesting the Biden administration, you know, kind of criticizes China, for example, for Chinese corporations for going into Africa and uh, with their development projects and creating climate displacement, but doesn't really think about, you know, what the U.S. has been doing in, in the Americas, for example, right? So there's a sort of inability to see sometimes where development has created climate change. I think the activists in the region who really fight back, especially indigenous activists, climate activists, are very attuned to the development displacement nexus in a way that a political leadership are not and are, don't want to because they do want to see private corporations as part of the solution and not the problem, in, especially in the Americas. So part of this is bringing in those voices to make sure that we're not missing um, some causes of displacement in the Americas. And I think, I mean, some groups are doing that, but I think much more needs to be done to actually bring in especially indigenous voices and sort of people who focus on the issues of development, how development uh, might implicate displacement uh, into the conversation much, much more. Great. Well, thank you so much. And actually, you know, those those comments at the end are really um, great segue for us to just mention some of the other sessions that we have coming up um, in this series. We have a session that's just for students um, to um, talk with human rights activists that are working in the climate change sphere that's coming up on March 14th. And then on March 30th, we're going to have another um, uh, webinar series where we're really focusing on those corporate actors and how is that influencing um, forced migration due to climate change or creating um, unstable environmental um, areas and how that's connected. So we hope that you all can uh, join us for that. I did not plan that response from Yale on that, but it worked really well, so thank you. Um, and then we'll uh, wrap up in uh, April 25th is going to be our the last part of the series and it's going to focus here um, locally and really trying to think through um, how in our our community working with diaspora communities um, and, and and tying together how how we can um, work together to to respond in our in our own zone to try to influence some of these um, national and international responses I just um, want to give a, a huge thank to Samudu and Yael for your time today and sharing your expertise and wisdom. I think we're taking away a lot of um, good context and, and really um, inspiration to, to, to continue to try to make these connections in, in our own interdisciplinary spheres here. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. <laughs>